Welcome to The Bridge. I'm your host, Scott Kink. A few weeks ago, we sat down with Artie Chang, the CEO and founder of Pantera Networks. This guy is a true tech entrepreneur, 15 years, self-funded with some you know, local and regional investors out there competing, surviving every day against the big tech companies in unified communications and collaboration. This is a guy whose tech was founded around working remote, and you'd think you know, embedded into the culture of the business. And yet they still struggled from some of the same cultural challenges that your business may be facing today. Um, and if you think you had some problems working during the pandemic, Artie has 10 children, 10, six of whom with adult jobs in the Bay Area who all decided to come home and work in the house during the pandemic. Um, he had some really interesting feedback about their employers' return to work plans and how his children, you know, his flesh and blood all kind of want different things out of work you know, post pandemic, super interesting. He called the phase we're in today, the evaluation phase, not the return to work phase. Businesses are still figuring this out. He also, and I hadn't really heard this from anyone, talked about the pandemic kind of hitting in a time of IT complacency. He said, this isn't the first time we've gone through something like this. Um, and yet we, it sort of hit in a period where we were comfortable with the way we were working, not challenging our norms, just sort of supporting the business from an IT perspective. He talked about, one of the challenges that we have right now is losing the ability to sort of onboard new folks into the culture, into the business with that, that over the shoulder, water cooler way of becoming a part of the culture. And he shared that his business has focused on competing by developing some interesting supervisory features that he believes, and I could probably support, are not actually in some of the other big platforms that you see out there. Um, so super interesting way of thinking about how do you compete, how you find those little ridges in, in which to compete in a ch very changing economy and a changing way that we work. So I'm going to stop babbling and I want to just get right to it. Here is my talk with Pantera Networks CEO and founder, Artie Chang. Well, welcome to the Bridge podcast for this week. Um, I am your host, Scott Kinka, Chief Strategy Officer of Bridgepoint Technologies. Um, and as you know from our other episodes, The Bridge is a podcast where we are having conversations with tech leaders um, about how they braved uh, the pandemic and, and bridged, pun intended, pre and post pandemic, how that changed, how it changed their company, how it changed the way they approach work, and hopefully how they can help provide you advice on how you can cross the bridge as well. My guest this morning is Artie Chang. It's, we, we had a little kerfluffle on uh, Eastern time zone versus Pacific time zone. So it's a little bit earlier for him than it is for me. Um, but Artie, tell us a little bit about Artie Chang and your company. Sure. Uh, so I won't start all the way back in the beginning, but I've been a tech uh, guy pretty much all my life. I uh, started my career at Bell Labs, uh, building 5ESS switches. So I'm pretty steeped in kind of building super high reliable telephony networks. I've, I've been that from the start of my career. Uh, I've had a number of uh, startups. I moved, I did my graduate work in, in California and Silicon Valley area. And so fell in love with the area. And, and so I've been out here for almost all of my career after Post Bell Labs. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm passionate about, about building companies uh, and with like-minded uh, people and solving business problems and, and really making an impact um, on businesses and how they uh, win business and, and, and acquire customers. So that's a little bit about me. Pantera is a company that really has its DNA roots in the cloud and in building uh, unified communications and collaborations and content sharing solutions uh, for uh, mid-market enterprises. And so um, kind of this whole pandemic has, has, has been a real uh, eye-opener for our customers, but not really an eye-opener for Pantera, because Pantera has been basically building products that support dynamically distributed workforce environments from day one. And, and when was day one for Pantera? So Pantera was, was started about 15 years ago, it was bootstrapped by a number of uh, high telephony or telephony uh, high net worth investors. And, and we put out our first product about uh, eight years ago and have never looked backwards since then and 
have been focused on delivering uh, communications and collaborations and content sharing solutions for mid-market enterprises since since day one. Fantastic. You know, it's interesting. We um, talked a little bit about in our pre-call about um, you know changes that have come to your company. We're, I want to talk about kind of two things. One, you're a technology company. It's always interesting when I have guests who um, didn't go through the mad scramble into remote collaboration uh, because they were already there or it was already their product, right? <laughs> but uh, but you still have some interesting perspective. Um, in going through a transition, you know, you mentioned you're working out of your your home. Um, were you was Panther as an organization always working out of your home, or did you transition there during the pandemic? So it's a little bit of both. Pantera was created really from day one as a distributed dynamic workforce environment. So this is even you know eight years ago, our development team is in India. Our operations team is in the East Coast. Our sales team is distributed across the United States. Um, so even at our headquarters in Silicon Valley, you know, we have a few people at headquarters. Now, uh, so we use our own products, obviously, to communicate uh, among all of us. Uh, uh, conference calls, video conference calls, team messaging, um, content sharing through the cloud. Uh, synchronization uh, of files through the cloud that was all happening you know eight years ago five years ago six years ago uh, what what was it. different when the pandemic hit we so I was going into the office you know and uh, I live in the in the north northeast bay and our office is in Silicon Valley so I was driving an hour every day four o'clock in the morning to, to, to miss traffic and, and then at uh, three o'clock in the afternoon to miss traffic two hours of my day was driving. And, you know, you can't do a video conference call while you're driving. Um, so when the pandemic hit, I you know, agree. We, I'm we made that it's not good. Yeah, it's not good. Um, and so when the pandemic hit, we, we made that conscious decision to move everybody obviously home. And, and while there were, we were working from home, the actual communication tools, the efficiency, the productivity really never wavered for us. Now, I can't say that for our customers. Our customers did go through this calamitous chaos uh, of, of scrambling to move their workforce uh, home. But for Pantera itself, it was almost business as usual, Yeah. Um, except for the, the occasional dog barking in the background. <laughs> did you – were there any – you know, that's the technology side of it. Were there cultural challenges that came into the business? I mean, you were already remote, but some of you were heading to the office. Did you, were there any moment where you said, you know what, we're going to have to make a, you know, a, a concerted effort to address this cultural challenge since we're not seeing each other? You know, what, how did you guys react to any of that? Or were you, was it really truly business as usual across the board? It, it really was business as usual because, uh, as I said, most of the team was distributed across the U.S. anyhow. You know, there was like five people at corporate headquarters. Um, but what I will tell you culturally, um, this is a little anecdotal. Uh, so I have 10 children, um, 10 wow. wonderful uh, kids. They're all uh, young adults uh, in the business world. And when the pandemic hit, six of them came back home. And, and I'm not saying for, for a week, they came back home for six months. Yeah. And so when you have six young adult professionals plus myself at home, all trying to do their work <laughs> at home, I mean, we literally had cross conference calls where one conference call could hear the other conference call in the next bedroom. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there, there was a little bit of cultural adjustment to, to, to the home and how home uh, life interacts and how how your kids interact, especially when they're professional. Um, that's that's not happening so much. And in fact, later on, I, I want to actually give some some experiences about what's happening now with work life and how people are adjusting now. But in that very beginning, it was it was a little calamitous to have you know six six professionals trying to work out of one house. <laughs> Well, I mean, let's follow that thread. We, we don't have to get back to it later. Tell me a little bit about, you know, what you were just saying about how people are adjusting now. 
Well, what's what's interesting is, you know, all my kids are in their 20s and in their 30s. They're young adults. They represent sort of the, the newest workforce as opposed to people such as ourselves, which are a little bit older uh, workforce. Um, the, the whole concept of everyone works at home or everybody has to now go back to the office, uh, you know, Elon Musk mandating that everybody has to go back to the office. A, a couple of my kids' companies mandated that they go back to the office. And there's a lot of resistance in, in, in the mandate. Uh, and what, what, I, what I've seen is that companies that leave it up to the employees, they are really work, they want to go back, but they don't want to be told that they have to go back. <laughs> the sense of community is, is still not there with virtual. Uh, yeah. No matter what, you know, Meta wants to claim the metaverse is going to be our, our way of life. Sense of community, especially for young professionals, is still absolutely there. So, you know, I have one daughter who works uh, at, at uh, DocuSign, which is, a, I think, a typical high-tech large company. Um, and they didn't mandate that they go back to work, but she wants to go back to work to for sense of community. And they set up uh, after-hour meetings uh, to get drinks or to talk about family or other non-business events and that sense so she loves going back but not necessarily have to go back yeah and i think that's uh, a concept that a lot of businesses and it and, and ctos and and it managers are gonna are gra are currently grappling with do you, do you you know it's interesting I, I read an article i don't recall the source we'll we'll find it and put it in the notes uh but that said, that somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of businesses have yet to actually make a final call on what their go-forward hybrid work environment is going to be. We're just kind of kicking the can down the curb, you know, and, and letting it interact. You're starting to see the Elons of the world say, come back to the office. Um, first, uh, as a two-part question, one, as you're talking to customers, do you find they're still trying to figure it out at this point? Or do you agree with that statement? Maybe 50% are not there. And then two, what are you telling them? If they if they haven't made the decision yet, you know I don't know if I can put a percentage number. What I think is we're in a phase now. We're we're past phase one, which I think was chaotic reaction. That, that's what <laughs> happened. You know, I like in, that in 2019 and 2020 and and even part of 2021. I think what we're into now is the evaluation period where management, IT managers, CTOs, uh, people who are responsible for the strategy, the, the, the going forward strategy of, of workforce distribution are, are faced with the uh, organic reaction of their employee base and how much that has input into the strategic going forward direction. So I think we're in an evaluation phase now, as part of that evaluation phase, you'll have some management teams who have strong managers like Elon, who will, I think he's testing the water. I think he's not mandating it as an edict forever. I think he's trying to see what is, you know, he, he loves to see reaction. I mean, that's that's why he's the number one Twitter Twitter uh, uh, um, create content creator uh, that they have. So I think, for our customers who are more mid-market enterprises, they are very responsive to their to their employee base. And I think a lot of them have come to the conclusion that they have to have a flexible, dynamically distributable workforce IT infrastructure, uh, you know, which is where Pantera Solution comes in and others, um, making sure that they have the ability to be flexible. Do, do you think that the there was a lot there. That was a great response. As I'm mentally writing down the follow-on questions and I can't figure out which one's going to be the best one because there was so much meat there. <laughs> Let me ask this question. You hit one thing in there about the tech leader in the business, whether that's the CIO, CTO, director of IT. You know, has their job changed? Because you were mentioning in the middle there that you're talking about the business strategy of going home, working remote, working hybrid. Um, 
And in a lot of cases, you know, I've always found often in businesses that are not tech businesses themselves that sometimes the tech leader would sit in the finance organization or sit in the operations organization or something along those lines. I mean, has that tech leader role changed to be more strategic just as the result of the conversation we were just having? You know, I, I, I think to some degree it has, but I'll give you a, a, a since I've been in the industry for a long yeah. time, um, probably longer than you, you know, there are waves in which the, the, the technology strategic decision makers have come, become com, uh, complacent. Okay. And, and then that usually is followed by a time period of chaos because some event happens. Now, this time it was a pandemic. Um, but if you look back in history, there have been uh, uh, supply chain shortage issues. There have been, you know, Internet outage issues. Uh, there have been all sorts of other uh, chaotic. There have been geopolitical impacts to technology. Um, and so what I think we, we saw with the pandemic is prior to the pandemic, there was sort of an, a, an, a time period of complacency by technologists and strategists. You know, people were were basically caught off guard. And so there was a there was a chaotic reaction. Yeah. I think that what the, the, the most important thing the pandemic has, as I think hopefully taught technologists and strategists in, in technology is, is, you know, complacency is not, not for the technologists. You, you got to make sure that you are proactively trying to figure out what is the next, quote, pandemic, because it won't be a pandemic next time. It'll be, you know, geopolitical World War III three kind of thing yeah. and people need direction. to make sure that if the yeah. internet goes down what what are how do we how does business continue on yeah, completely. it could be a total chip shortage which which is what we've we've experienced how does the internet keep going how does business keep going we as service providers are constantly thinking about that how do we make sure our solution is available uh, to our to our uh, customers no matter what the next pandemic actually happen completely is. yeah i mean it's that's like uh you know the old concept of trying to figure out what your disaster recovery strategy is after you've had a disaster right so i i totally get it right then it's too late i mean and it was funny i mean we're getting asked all the time about you know the recession now right i mean that's the next piece the supply chain issues have not gone away um it's it's a it's truly an interesting time uh, you know you you just mentioned you talked a little bit about as technologists you know, we're always looking over the horizon. We're trying to make sure that the products are available. We're trying to make sure that they meet need. Um, and you talked about kind of the chaotic reaction of our customers in the pandemic. You know, let's talk a little bit about product. I mean, I know that you're, you, you know, you, you are very intimate with the strategy of Pantera. Um, what, what did you add? What did you change? How did your roadmap? I know you were already a collaboration company and you were already eating your own dog food, if you will, using your own product. But tell us about some of the things that you guys have done inside of your offerings, maybe in reaction to some of our new reality. Yeah, I, I mean, we, as, as I mentioned, we were already a dynamically distributable collaboration, content sharing, communications product company. But what what happened with the pandemic is, you know, in, instead of having one on one video conferences or three person video conferences, you know, companies wanted to have all 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 hands on deck conferences with 30, 40, 50, 100, 500 people. Um, they wanted to have all of their weekly meetings that they used to have in person with groups or departments of 50 now now went virtual. And so, you know, our first generation uh, uh, team conferencing product uh, was not up to the task, quite frankly. And so we set out to put in, put together a second generation product that really could deliver business quality uh, remote team conferencing and, and, and webinar capability. And we did that with our new product called Connect. And I'll just give you one anecdotal feature, which is uh, unique to Connect, actually, in the industry. 
the one of the things that 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 our customer base was demanding is they said, well, we're moving from audio calls now to video calls, and that's how we do our business. It's through video calls. We we do video calls with our customers. We demo our products through video calls. We we handle our final uh, uh, closing deal meetings with video calls, which is typically with our customers, C level people. Um, and we have no way to monitor or manage or supervise those video calls. We used to have this, this concept in an audio call called supervisory modes. And that's where a supervisor of, of the sales agent could, could actually silently join an audio call, could, could actually listen in, could whisper to the agent to give them advice or even barge in if, if it was going sideways. And that capability, curiously, is not was not available on video calls from any of our competitors or anyone in the industry. But it was something that all of our customers collectively said, why isn't it? And so we asked that same question and, and our development uh, gave us the answer. And the answer was, well, because we're going to do it first. And so <laughs> our Connect uh, team conferencing solution supports supervisory modes so a supervisor on a video call can actually silently join that video call and listen in and see how the customer is reacting can actually whisper or chat privately with the the agent and then if necessary can actually barge into the call and where the customer will actually see uh, the supervisor and that feature is being used uh, exclusively by our customers on a daily basis and by us you know our, our yeah. sales team uses it we we use it probably 30 times a day it's super unique you know it's interesting so that gives you an example of sort of what we've had to do yeah i mean it's interesting too you, you know we were talking earlier about the cultural effect of you know your daughter as an example not uh not wanting to be told to go back to the office but wanting to have that option you know, I've heard from a lot of customers about, you know, one of the things that feels forever lost is the over the shoulder learning, right, of, you know, working next to somebody, hearing them interact with customers, hearing them solve problems. You know, it, it, it just it feels like an interesting parallel that you're getting at, too, is that ability to sure the supervisor will have to make time to listen in. But that is a way maybe to get back some of that over the shoulder learning that people crave in the office community that, that feels perhaps a little lost right now. Yeah. And you know, you're at first glance, pe people may say, Oh, that's a little too much big brother. But what we found is, you know, when you're selling, your whole goal is to make the yeah. close the deal. And you know, the more help you have in closing that deal. Um, and I talk with my, my VP of sales, Dave, Dave Ryan, uh, almost on a daily basis. And he says, you know, my salespeople want me, want me. Uh, and, and if I'm not supervising uh, a connect video call, he'll get text, you know, he'll get a chat message like, you know, you, you need you need to supervise me on this call because it's a way to to bring more resources in real time to making the close. Yeah. And that's really what sales is all about is is not closing tomorrow what you could close today if you had the resources. Yeah, you think about all the applications in the contact center in account management, you know, there's lots of applications of that. That's it was super interesting. Um, I think it's a good segue. Tell us about let's just talk about 18 to 24 months. You get it you know, already you've got the podium here, shameless prediction for our listeners, whether it be in tech you know, or in business, uh, throw something out there, 18 to 24 months. Well, I don't know how much of a prognosticator I am on, on future, future directions of, of non-tech things, but I will say that I think, I think, as I said before, businesses are going to evaluate how to move forward. And I think what's going to happen is the, the set static, IT infrastructure environment is a thing of the past. It is a relic um, that companies will mandate that their IT infrastructure be dynamically configurable, dynamically uh, support any hybrid mode of workforce they, that, that uh, may be required to efficiently transact business in the future. 
Um, and I think that the pandemic is 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 was just a a chaotic moment of many moments that are going to continue to happen. And and I hope that you know the world will will get through. Obviously, every one of these things is as intact as possible. We're going to do what we can as Pantera to to be the best steward to our customers of delivering the best solutions and being the best partner for them. Because a lot of it isn't just solutions. There are many customers where we just had to hold their hands. Yeah. I mean, they were just absolutely going bonkers. <laughs> we had one customer, which was a cruise ship uh, company, and they literally went from 250 seat call center capability to five in, in one month. And, and they were in term and you know, it was a it was an issue of basically, do we hold them to term uh, as a as a legal T and C, or do we hold their hands and and be stewards of our customers? And we chose the latter. We we chose to really work with them, and and they're existing today, and they're not back to 250, but they're back to 75 seats. So so uh, we're we're not here just to make the buck. We're here to be stewards to make an impact. That's why I'm here. Um, we want to leave a positive footprint on this I appreciate world. appreciate it. Um, and I appreciate the conversation. Um, it's part of what you're doing here. And I hope that the conversation we've had so far, you know, is, is giving IT leaders, tech leaders, something to think about um, and learning from your experience. I'm gonna, we're going to have two fun questions, though, before we end. Uh, the, the first one there would be, let's assume... That I thought that all of them were fun. Let's, of course, of course. Let's say non-business and tech. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> So the first one is this. This is a little bit techy. Uh, the, whatever the next thing that's going to happen that you were just talking about occurs, and Artie's got one app on his phone or, or laptop that he's going to be able to use on a go-forward basis. What's the most indispensable app you've got uh, if you could only use one? You mean besides our streams app, which would obviously be the most indispensable app. <laughs> hey, you're loving in, in your own product. It's is, totally it fine. Is. Tell us why. Yeah, no, it is it, because it, essentially I work 24 by 7. It's indispensable to me. It's the one app that I keep. You know, you, you have sort of the nighttime mode where you turn yep. off everything. That app is excluded from the nighttime Got mode. It. And because we have people around the world and our development team is in India, you know, I, yeah. it, it, it's working 24 by seven. But I will tell you that, that uh, just as a, as, a, as a fun aside, I have found that I don't know how the world worked without Google Maps. Google Maps is, is, is just fundamentally changed how life and travel I just came back from a from a wedding and one of my daughters got married in, in Ghent, Belgium. Okay. And I was there for this fantastically phenomenal fairy tale wedding. And I, here I am, you know, on Google Maps in Brussels and Ghent, and I'm just I'm basically getting around as if I was a, a local resident. I, I had no problems finding trains and spots and restaurants all through Google Map. And Amazing. uh you know, it spawned all these industries like Uber. Uber wouldn't exist without Google Maps uh, capability. No, so that's a great. I will insight. say yeah. that's an amazing app. No, you know what? I appreciate that. That's that's really good insight. I just uh, I just got back from a couple of weeks in Italy with my family. We were celebrating my oldest, who's moving on to her post you know graduate life uh, now, flying the nest. I don't I don't know that they ever completely get off the payroll already, but flying the nest at least. Um, and uh, we spent time, you know, two weeks in Italy. I don't know how we, we had a driver, we had all that stuff, but just walking around town. I mean, my maps were up. I killed my, I killed my battery, but I had maps up the entire time getting around. Definitely a life changer. Yeah. All right. One more. Here's a fun one. Um, this is sort of the, the, which, which supporting role would you prefer to play? All right. So th here's your choice and you're going to make a choice and tell me why. The bass player in your favorite band the uh, supporting actor, not lead actor, supporting actor in your favorite movie, or kind of like the gadget play guy on your favorite football team. Which one would you choose? 
the gadget. So in every one, these are supporting roles, not the not oh, the star, that... but you know, important cogs in the wheel of the band, the football team, or the movie. That's 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 a hard one. Uh, I would probably say a supporting role, okay. acting role. You know, I, I I've always you know you. I think you as, as well as I, you know, we, because of the positions we're in, we're always uh, giving speeches in front of people or we're videotaping a podcast. Uh, I think we're, we're, you know, closet actors right. in our time. Uh, you know, I was, I was the nerd in high school, uh, but, you know, I've always wanted to be either in a sporting role or, Probably not in the main role, but in a supporting role. And there are so many great supporting actors out there. Um, you know, the one that comes to mind just this year who won it uh, as a deaf, uh, a deaf person. I'm trying to remember the, the the name of the movie escapes me. It was the name of the town, but um, he was an amazing yeah. supporting actor. Um, uh, I think you know we'll figure movie. it out. We'll stick so, it in the notes, the show notes, so that people. We, we'll, we'll find that out. We'll make sure that they know what your favorite movie yeah, is and who that actor was. Uh, Artie, where can, where can our listeners find out more information about you and about Pantera, should they be interested? Well, certainly on our website, you know, www.panteranetworks.com, which I'm sure you'll put in the, in the yep. notes at the bottom. Um, if they want to try streams, they can simply go to streams.us. Um, and sign up or, or try the product out themselves. We're obviously on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, get, get to me directly. Um, you know, we love to hear stories. We love to hear challenges. Uh, we're here to, uh, to make life Fantastic. better. And, and, you know, and for our listeners, you things. know, obviously at Bridgepoint, you know, our job is to help advise in the selection of technology partners like Pantera Networks, you know, our, our companies are partnered together. Um, so obviously engage with Bridgepoint as well. Um, and so, so again, uh, thank you very much, Artie. This has been a lot of fun. I apologize that it's a little bit earlier in the morning than you were uh, hoping to do this originally. And I appreciate you rearranging your schedule. This has been a fantastic conversation. Yeah, no, I have to say, uh, Scott, it's been fantastic. Bridgepoint's been an amazing partner uh, with us. Uh, so together, we we see uh, you know great opportunities in the future. We've had great success in the past, and we appreciate the the uh, relationship. Fantastic, Artie Chang. I'm Scott Kinka. This has been the Bridge. Thanks for listening, and uh, stay tuned for our next episode. Listen, if you made it this far, there must have been some good content or you're just a fan or a relative of mine. In either case, we appreciate you spending your most valuable asset with us, your time. We don't take that lightly. We'd also like to say one more time that we are appreciative of Bridgepoint Technologies and their belief and sponsorship of this show. We hope that if you or someone you know is thinking about your company's digital transformation or simply the next IT project that you may not have that resources, budget, or time to get to, I'm sure that Bridgepoint, one of the country's fastest growing technology advisory and procurement firms can help. Check out Bridgepoint at bridgepointtechnologies.com. Don't forget the E on Bridgepoint or simply reach out to me at skinka, S-K-I-N-K-A at bpt 3 bpt3.net. Also, take a minute, please, if you would, to give us a five-star review on your favorite platform. It helps give us the visibility to reach other people like you. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bridge. I am Scott Kinka. And until next time, there's a lot of noise out there. In business and in life, do what you can to be the signal. Thanks.